In our last lesson, we noted that Pilate turns Jesus over to be crucified. Now, when you're reading Matthew and Mark, he turns Jesus over to the Roman soldiers, and then from there, they enter into the period of crucifixion. But, when you read John's account, Pilate turns Jesus over to the Roman soldiers, and then... Jesus comes back into and finishes up the trial of Pilate. So that's where we're going to spend our time this evening is looking again at the conclusion of the trial of Pilate and then the events that lead right up to the hill called Golgotha outside the city of Jerusalem. The title of this particular series is The Sayings of the Crucifixion. There were many discussions, there were many words, there were many conversations that took place from the time that Jesus and His apostles leave the upper room until the time Jesus ascends back to the right hand of the throne of God. And those have been the focus of these lessons. Tonight, if we were going to subtitle this particular lesson, it would be In the Hands of the Roman Soldiers and the Via Dolorosa. We'll come back and explain that term, Via Dolorosa, in just a few minutes. But let's begin by looking at the Roman soldiers. At one point in the trial before Pilate, he turns Jesus over to the Roman soldiers in order for Jesus to be scourged. Notice John 19, 1. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now, Pilate did not do that directly, but it was by Pilate's orders that Jesus would be scourged, and it would be the Roman soldiers who would carry that out. I believe that we are beginning to look at a period of brutality toward Jesus at this particular time. In fact, not just brutality, but extreme brutality. Jesus would have been taken by those soldiers and He would have been scourged with what is known as a cat of nine tails. It was the handle of a whip that had nine pieces of leather that flowed from the top of it and tied to each one of those pieces of leather were stones, glass, and metal. Jesus would have been beaten 40 stripes save one. His back would have been torn all the way to the vital organs, all the way to the bones, and His flesh would have bled and poured blood throughout that particular beating. Many individuals did not survive a Roman scourging. But Jesus not only took the scourging, but He also took the mockery and the blasphemy and the criticisms and the cynicism of all of those Roman soldiers. We are told that Jesus was led into the common hall by Matthew. Mark refers to it as the praetorium. Just outside of Pilate's hall, there was a courtyard. And surrounding that courtyard were buildings which housed the praetorium guard of the Roman Empire. The Roman soldiers would have took Jesus out into this courtyard and the Bible tells us that they brought the whole band of soldiers together. Adam Clark's... or. Uh, Albert Barnes says there may have been as many as four to six hundred soldiers in that band who would have gathered to witness the beating of Jesus and also to take place in the mockery of the Son of God. Folks, that's a lot of individuals, isn't it? We find a list in the Bible of the numerous things these Roman soldiers did to our Lord and Savior. Number one, they stripped Him and put on Him a scarlet robe. Matthew 27, verse 28. The Bible says that they took a crown of thorns and they crushed it upon the head of Jesus. Matthew 27, 29. 
They put a reed in his right hand. I find that interesting. In his right hand. It was to be a scepter in the hand of a king. Matthew 27, 29. The Bible says that they saluted him. Mark 15, verse 18. They bowed their knees before the Son of God. Matthew 27, verse 29. And they cried out with this phrase, Hail, King of the Jews! Matthew 27, 29. They spat upon him. They took the reed out of his hand and smote him on the head with it. Matthew 27 verse 30. And John's gospel reveals that they also smote him with their hands. Can you imagine the brutality of those soldiers? Folks, this is a man whom most of them had never met. They were not personally acquainted with with the Christ, the Son of God. They had absolutely no interest in Him. They were Roman soldiers. They were citizens of Rome. Their loyalty was to Caesar. They could have cared less who this Jewish individual was. But the Roman brutality was well known and was carried out upon the Son of God. In their minds they were thinking this. What do you do with someone? who unlawfully claims to be a king. Well, here's some of the things that you do. You humiliate him. You mock him in the presence of others. You expose his weaknesses. Remember, kings usually stand strong before their nation, do they not? But here the Roman soldiers were weakening the Christ in the presence of the Jews. And also... You teach this man that he is not who he claims to be. You see, that was the purpose of this particular brutality and mocking and blasphemy toward the Son of God. You think you're a king, we'll show you that you're not. As I was thinking about what was going on on this particular occasion... A verse came to mind and it's found in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. I want you to think about those Roman soldiers for a moment. They were on their knees and the Bible says this, and they worshipped him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. It was a mock worship. It was a blasphemous worship. King Jesus, take our worship One day, those evil soldiers will bow the knee again before King Jesus. For the Bible says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, of things on the earth, of things under the earth. Now note this. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can you imagine when the heavens open again, when those Roman soldiers come forth out of the grave and peer into the eyes of that man whom they bowed before and mocked, and are now bowed before Him and worshiping Him, confessing His name as the true and living God. Can you imagine what those men will experience? But that is exactly where they'll be. Prostrate before the Son of God. I find it interesting that this maneuver of Pilate was not enough for the Jews. Notice what the text says in John 19 beginning at verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. And Jesus came forth, note this, wearing a crown of thorns and 
a purple robe. Folks, can you imagine what Jesus looked like before the Jews at this time? Remember, He'd been scourged. And now He stands before this group of Jews with a crown of thorns on His head, blood pouring down His face. This purple robe laid upon Him as if He is royalty trembling and bleeding before that mob. And he points to him and Pilate says, Behold the man! But notice the Jews, when the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! What Pilate did was nothing more than motivate this crowd to want even more What they had wanted all along, folks. All they wanted is death, isn't it? Wouldn't you love to get a Jew off, one of those Jewish leaders, and just ask him, do you love all men? Oh yes, I love all men. But yet, there in the face of Jesus Christ, they despised that man. They hated that man. And they wanted him dead. John 19, 7 makes an interesting statement. The Jews say this. We have a law. And according to that law, he should be put to death. Because he makes himself the Son of God. You see, as far as the Jews were concerned, Jesus was guilty of blasphemy. He's made himself equal with God. And according to our law, when you blaspheme God, you deserve to die. But notice the phrase. Because he calls himself the Son of God. The minute that Pilate heard those words, he was deeply troubled. In fact, John 19 tells us that he was greatly afraid. Now remember, Pilate knows he's standing before an innocent man, isn't he? He's proclaimed that several times during the course of this very trial. And now the Jews are saying, this man says he's the Son of God. And Pilate was deeply afraid. He brings Jesus off privately again and he asks him a question. Whence art thou? He already knew Jesus was a Galilean. He already knew that Jesus was a Jew. He may have even known that Jesus was the son of Joseph and the son of Mary. Whence are you? He's not asking about his lineage, folks. He's asking about, are you a God? You see, when he heard he's the son of God, he trembled. And I want to know, are you God? The Bible says Jesus answered him not a word. You think that ticked Pilate off just a little? Oh yeah. And Pilate didn't stop. Pilate made this statement to him. Know ye not that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Don't you know who you're standing before? Just tell me who you are. Because I have power to do whatever I need to do today. Remember Jesus' response? Thou couldst have no power at all over me except it were given thee from above. There's two interesting points that we could just sit down here and preach on for a while if we really wanted to. One of them is this. Pilate acknowledged the power of his office. That's interesting, isn't it? I have power to crucify you. Now listen to what he says. And I have power to what? To release you. He knew that. I'm the governor. I'm the king. I'm the installed authority of the Roman government. I have power to do whatever I need to do. Folks, Jesus was innocent. Pilate should have released that man 
and he acknowledged the power that he had to do it and did not do it. Why? Because he was a coward. That's why. He was scared of the Jews. He was scared of an uprising. And rather than acting judiciously, and rather than enacting justice, he condemned a just man to die, even though he had the power to release him. I don't know about you, but Pilate kind of makes me mad. Doesn't he you? He knew he was innocent. He had the power to release him. And he had him killed. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Now that, I say all that to say this next statement, folks. Jesus taught Pilate that everyone in a position of authority is put there by the Almighty God. Pilate, you could have no power over me at all except it were given you from above. Every person, I don't care how little your authority is or how great your authority is, if you are in a position of delegated authority, you got that authority from God Almighty. That's pretty concerning, isn't it? You see, God would ultimately hold Pilate accountable for his actions. Because God put him in authority. But Jesus didn't stop there. That's what interests me. He didn't just stop there with Pilate. He says this, But he that hath delivered me unto thee, he hath the, watch this, greater sin. We've always asked the question, haven't we? Are there little sins and are there big sins? And we always have a common response. Oh, all sins are just the same. And there is a sense wherein that's true. All sin is the transgression of the law of God. But my friends, Jesus lets us know that there are some sins that are greater than than other sins. Was Pilate in sin? Yes. Was he acting unjustly? Yes. Would he be held accountable by God? Absolutely. But then he says, but he that delivered me unto thee, he hath the greater sin. Folks, those Jews out there, they had the greater sin. Their hearts were filled with envy and hatred. Their hearts yearned for the death of Jesus Christ. We want Him dead. And that's the only end that we will accept. They trumped up false charges against Him. They brought in false witnesses against Him. Folks, they denied the plain evidence that Jesus said to look at. Look at my works. They prove that I am who I say that I am. Those Jews that day had the greater sin. In John 19, 12 through 16, we have another section that we could just preach on for a while if we wanted to. From that point forward, Pilate did everything he could do to try to release Jesus. Now, I find that interesting because all he had to do is say what? He's innocent, I'm letting him go. But he didn't do that. You see, he was trying to find a way to please the Jews and let Jesus go. Folks, that's not happening. The Jews immediately respond with a very intimidating response. Listen to what they say. If ye let this man go, ye are no friend of Caesar. For he that maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Was that a true statement or a false statement? That's true. Any man who rose up saying, I am a king, was going against the authority and the emperor of Rome himself. So the Jews reminded Pilate of that. If you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. 
His choice was simple, wasn't it? Am I going to be a friend of this peasant or am I going to be a friend of my emperor, Caesar? That's not very hard to choose when you're in a political position like Pilate, is it? It's amazing. Pilate again bring, again brings Jesus out. Remember, he taking him into a private quarters. During that time, Jesus had the robe taken off of him again, had his own clothes put on, and Pilate brings him back out, and he says, "Behold, your king!" And once again, the Jews demand crucifixion. Crucify him! Listen to what they say in answer to this question. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. See the answer? We have no king but Caesar. Wow. Put it in the context, folks. We're in the first century. The Jews despised the Roman government. Despised them. The Jews hated Caesar. The Jews thought of themselves as the people of God. They thought of themselves as the ones who should be free and ruling the world. And now they were under bondage to this wicked nation known as Rome under the leadership of Caesar. They despised Caesar. They were looking for a Messiah, weren't they? They were looking for a king to deliver them out of the hand of Rome. And yet now what do they do? We have no king but Caesar. They confess their loyalty to an ungodly emperor. Why? They hated Jesus more than they hated Rome. That is unbelievable, isn't it? Folks, the wheels have been set in motion. The trial of Pilate is totally over. Jesus is now released into the care of the Romans for execution. He is about to walk what is known as the Via Dolorosa. It is that pathway from the judgment hall of Pilate out of the city gates of Jerusalem and to a hill just outside of that city that is referred to as the place of the skull. Hebrews, Jews refer to it as Golgotha. Romans called it Calvary. wasn't a very long walk, only about a half a mile. Doesn't sound long, does it? The meaning of the words, the painful or difficult way, the Via Dolorosa. There were three things that transpired on that way to Calvary. And we want to briefly look at those three things. Number one, Simon carries Jesus' cross. Mark 6, or that should be 15, verse 21. Mark 15, verse 21. Now, when Jesus initially leaves that courtyard, when he leaves Pilate's judgment hall, he is carrying his own cross. How do I know that? Because of John 19, 17. The text says, then Jesus went forth, listen to it, bearing his own cross to a place which is called the place of the skull or in Hebrew, Golgotha. When Jesus initially left, he was carrying his own cross beam. But somewhere along the way, Simon, a Cyrenian, was compelled to bear his cross. Now there's some things that I don't know. 
I don't know how long Jesus carried that cross. 100 feet, 200 feet, outside the city gate. I just don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. Now we have all heard when preachers preach, they say something like this. Jesus finally fell out of weakness under the weight of the cross. The Bible doesn't say that. Not one verse says that. But it very well may, could have been, couldn't it? Jesus had lost a lot of blood. He had been up the entirety of the evening before. He had been through physical violence and emotional difficulties as well. And it very well have been that he just fell and could not have gone any further. I don't know that. But I do know that a man named Simon was called to carry that cross. And they compelled Simon the Cyrenian who was passing by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. I've got a sermon about Simon bearing the cross of Jesus that I might just preach right now. It'd be, it's only another 30 minutes. Y'all can handle it, can't you? Four points. Just as Simon bore the cross of Jesus, we too have to bear our cross, don't we? Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Luke 9 verse 23. Secondly, folks, Simon was compelled to bear that cross. Rome was in authority and whatever a Roman soldier wanted you to do, you better do. If he wanted you to give him a drink, you better give him a drink. If he wanted you to give him food, you better give him food. If he wanted you to carry his backpack, you better carry his backpack. Can you imagine, Simon, there he is, just passing by, and a soldier says, Hey, you, take that cross to Golgotha. He was compelled to do it, forced to do it, commanded to do it, not us. Folks, our cross that you and I are compelled to bear is voluntary, isn't it? We take up that cross all by ourselves because we want to. Thirdly, Simon may have touched the blood of Jesus on that occasion, mightn't he? Remember his back had been literally beaten to smithereens, folks. When they threw that cloak back on his back, the blood would have seeped through that garment. And now Simon grabs that cross and has to throw it upon his back. He may have gone home with blood stains upon his garment. But the blood of Jesus didn't do anything for Simon that day, did it? Think about that. He touched the literal blood of Jesus. Didn't do a thing, but folks... The blood of Jesus does wonderful things for us, does it not? In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, Ephesians 1, verse 7. And Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood, Revelation 1, verse 5. Simon touched the literal blood of Jesus and it did nothing for him. But my friends, spiritually, you and I, have contacted the blood of Jesus as Christians and have been cleansed of all iniquities. Point four, Simon had a story to tell, didn't he? Can you imagine what Simon told his friends and family when he finally got back home? Guys, you're not going to believe this. I got to Jerusalem, I was just passing by, and these Romans, they just grabbed me and made me carry this man's cross all the way to the hill called Golgotha. You wouldn't believe how heavy that thing is. I've seen criminals carry it. I can't believe how heavy it was. And there that man was. He'd been beaten to death. And just look, look at my garments, blood all over them, his own blood 
What a story he had to tell. Folks, don't we have a story to tell too? Just like Simon did. Our precious Lord and Savior was taken to the hill of Calvary and crucified for the sins of man. We have a story to tell. So Simon was a part of this journey on the Via Dolorosa, but there were also Some women referred to as the daughters of Jerusalem. Jesus had the weight of that cross removed. He's walking along that road and the Bible tells us that there were many people who followed Him, including women, and they moaned and they bewailed Him. They knew what was transpiring. Some of His most faithful followers were women, were they not? Very close women. Some of them related to Him, some of them not. And there they were, following Jesus. And at some point, somehow, Jesus passes by these daughters of Jerusalem, these Jewish women, and He strikes up a very brief conversation with them. He begins with this. Don't weep for me. You weep for yourselves. Ye daughters of Jerusalem... Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and your children. Wow. Pretty strong words, aren't they? They had every reason to weep for Jesus. This is a man they loved. This is a man they served. This is a man they cared for. This is a man who they had put the entirety of their hopes in, and now he's going to his death. And he says, oh no, don't you dare weep for me. You need to weep for yourselves. And he gives them the reason because there's pending doom. For behold, the days come when they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the womb that gave no children and the paps that gave no suck. Blessed are those ladies who have never, ever had children. For then shall they say unto the mountains, Fall on us! And unto the hills, cover us! What in the world is Jesus talking about? Don't weep for me, but you better weep for yourselves. You need to weep for that day when there's coming destruction. When you're going to be crying out for the mountains to cover you and the hills to cover you. You need to... Weep for yourselves because there's coming a day when it's going to be better to not have children than to have children. My friends, he's talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Don't cry for me now. You cry for yourselves because there's coming a horrific day When you will wish you had no children because you see when the Roman armies came against the city of Jerusalem they knew this is the end. And better would it be not to have children than to have them if you're going to flee for your life and find safety. It's easier without children than with them. And you're going to be crying out that the mountains slay you rather than falling into the hands of the Romans and they're slaying you. He then expresses a word of wisdom in a question. For if they do this in a green tree, what things shall be done in the dry? What in the world is he talking about? Right there with Jesus in their midst, folks, that's the green tree, isn't it? Can it get any better than that? To have the Son of God literally in your presence? To be able to hear Him speak, to be able to touch Him, to hold Him, to have fellowship with Him? There's no better time in the history of the world at that particular time 
The green tree is here. And look what they're doing. And if they're doing that now, what shall be done in the dry? What was going to happen in the next 20, 30 years after Jesus ascended to the right hand of God? Was the Jewish nation just all of a sudden going to accept the Christ? Absolutely not. They ridded themselves of that man. They crucified him. They accepted the lie that the body of Jesus was stolen by the disciples. They hated the apostles. They hated the preaching of the gospel. They despised the church and they persecuted the church of God and attempted to waste it, did they not? And one day, Jesus says, there's coming pending doom upon the nation of the Jews. My friends, the destruction of Jerusalem was a horrible day of history for mankind. Did you know that? The taking away of an evil nation that was fighting against the Son of the living God. So Jesus warns them about that day. Third event, two thieves. And there were also two malefactors led with him to be put to death. The Bible says. You see, Jesus did not exit Jerusalem alone. There were two others on that road with Him and probably carrying their crosses as well. Two male factors. Jesus was counted as a criminal that day, wasn't He? The people who saw them leave... The hall of Pilate, the ones who saw him going down the road to crucifixion, what did they think? Look at those criminals. Look at those evil men. They're about to put them to death. And Jesus was included in the number and fulfilled prophecy, did he not? Isaiah 53 verse 9, he was numbered among the transgressors. How did Isaiah know that? Isaiah wrote 640 years before Jesus came to this earth. 670 years before this prophecy was fulfilled. How did Isaiah know that? The Messiah, the suffering servant of God, would be numbered with the transgressors. How did he know that? He knew it by inspiration of God, didn't he? And prophesied of it years before it ever transpired. Those two men, they're going to be the subject of a lesson in the near future, aren't they? Because you see, they're going to be hung on either side of our Lord. And there's going to be some conversation that transpires even between Jesus and these two criminals, aren't they? As I was thinking about this lesson, there were five points that came to mind. Number one, the brutality of men toward our Savior. And sadly, not much has changed. Has it? There would still be individuals today who, if Jesus came to earth, would ultimately want to put Him to death for His claims. Number two, a judge who was given authority from God and yet he refused to promote justice. Number three, the beginning of our Lord's physical agonies. Scourging, mocking by the Romans, the carrying of His cross until another was compelled to carry it. Fourthly, Jesus' compassion for His people. Don't weep for me. You need to weep for yourselves because judgment is coming. How can a man who is suffering that greatly be more concerned about others than he is even for himself? Lastly, Jesus was an innocent man numbered among transgressors. There have been at least five expressions of innocence throughout those trials and yet here Jesus was numbered among the transgressors. 
Folks, our Lord went through some horrible experiences. And just think, He hasn't even been crucified yet. And why did He do it? Because of who we are. Sinners, didn't He? That's why He did it. Why did He do it? Because He loves us even though we are sinners. That God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. That ought to impress us. That ought to change the heart of every human being and cause that individual to come running to the Christ asking the question, Lord, what will you have me to do to be saved? The steps are simple. Hear the gospel. Believe in the Christ as the Son of God, repent of sins. Confess the name of Jesus and be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That's exactly what was done on Pentecost Day. The very first day the gospel is preached, was it not? If you don't believe it, just go read Acts chapter 2. That's exactly what transpired. They heard, they believed the message, cried out, what should we do? Peter said, what? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And they that gladly received His word were baptized. Acts 2.38 verse 41. Maybe you're an erring child of God and for some reason this story of Jesus just doesn't impress you very much anymore, folks. This is the love of God expressed on our behalf. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 17, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Folks, I have to serve God because of what Jesus did. We need to let the love of God sink deeply into our hearts and serve Him faithfully unto the last day. If you're not doing